Henry, thanks for joining us. If you want to just start off and just tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, where you grew up and what your childhood was like. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so I grew up in England in the north. I grew up in a, uh, outside a city called Hull, um, not known for its kind of glamour and, and excitement, but uh, it was a lovely part of the world to, to grow up in. And um but yeah, growing up there was great. We uh, it was um, it was a kind of nice part of the world, and then eventually, I think later later on, moved down to the south of England near Stonehenge, which is um, complete opposite ends of the country. Growing up in England, were you like surrounded by any kind of filmmaking, or did you watch any films that kind of inspired you to want to become a filmmaker later on in life? Or well. Growing up in the uh, growing up in Hull, they used to do a kind of Saturday matinee films where you'd go along as kids and you'd go along to the the, the cinema and they used to do, still do intervals. I, I mean, I sound older than I am, but they'd still do intervals in the middle of film where you could go off and get sweets and whatever. But they'd show like kind of weird horror films for kids, and so I just remember these kind of completely beguiling, terrifying kind of English folk horror films that they'd play. And I just remember, I don't remember what the films were, but I just remember scenes from them, you know, in this kind of old, um, it was a kind of medieval hall was the, um, was the, uh, was where the cinema was. So it was a very weird place uh, in itself. And, and yeah, that was, there was a lot of kind of films going on there, or at least my weekends were. Um, but outside of that, it was, yeah, it was, that was kind of my main exposure to film. And then what about like at home? Did you rent like uh, VHS tapes or DVDs or watch television shows? Like what kind of things were you kind of watching and inspired by? Well, I remember we got our first VHS player. I must have been around 11, 10 or 11. Um, and that was kind of 1990. Um, and I think that kind of, that opened the gateway to this kind of opportunity because obviously going around to friends' houses, they'd have a VHS player, you'd be able to kind of watch films or go to your uncles, whatever. But my parents, for some reason, were, were late in the game with that. And um, uh, the minute it did come, it was it was a kind of flood of, okay, I want to see this film, I want to see all these films. So yeah, there was there's quite a bit of that. Um, and as well as that, I think my, my dad worked at an art college and there were filmmakers there that were intriguing there was one student who went off to direct music videos for radiohead who got um a director called jamie thraves and i remember seeing his video for um the song just and it's everybody uh this one guy lying on the floor and this policeman looking over and asking him you know why are you lying on the floor and it's all in subtitles and it was very mysterious, very intriguing, the band playing in this kind of window above. And then gradually as the song goes on, they're getting angry. And why are you like, get up off the floor? Why are you lying? And then the end shot is just every single person who was questioning him is also lying on the floor. No explanation. This kind of brilliant comment on this kind of hysterical conspiracy later, like probably a lot of what we're we're going through now. But I found it fascinating. I found it really intriguing piece of uh piece of cinema as a music video um and that opened my eyes to the kind of then that that current vogue you had glazer you had michelle gondry um all producing these stunning and spike jones these stunning music videos that inspired so it was a kind of gateway drug the vhs player to then be able to watch these films that you could source on vhs uh, it was it was um yeah that was my kind of gateway into it and my ignited my passion um in what was to be my career later on so yeah so early on did you like pick up a camera or did you like get any experience early on or like i know you did like graphic design first like what was like the the transition like so it's a weird transition actually so at first I, as I as I said, uh, uh, you know, I was really keen on when seeing these music videos and seeing this kind of new way of producing these kind of short form, intriguing stories that opened my eyes to that. And then I got my hands on a DNA D, which is a kind of English awards company. 
and they have a VHS that they used to release every year with all the best music videos and all the best commercials from around the world. And it kind of showed me this, holy shit, you can tell stories in 30 seconds. And, you know, that was at the time, again, when English commercials were really uh, in, in, in their heyday. You had, um, again, Glazer and Gondry and Spike Jones in America doing these astounding short form pieces and Frank Budgeon, who was kind of the god of commercials. And that ignited my passion, which led to me kind of wanting to make films myself. And I tried, you know, I couldn't afford a, a, a you know, a, um, a handy cam, a, a Sony kind of whatever it was, uh, um, camcorder. Um, so I eventually had a car boot sale or, a, you know, the Americans a yard sale. But I think uh, in Oz, you'd probably call it a car boot sale. Is it the same? Uh, garage, garage sale, we call it. That's, that's quite Americanized. So, but yeah, and I picked up a Super 8 camera and um, and used that, you know, to tell you've got three minutes to, to shoot with or three and a bit minutes, three minutes, 20 seconds or whatever the weird maths are. And uh, that was my kind of way in. And then from there, I was obsessed. And I remember going to a DNAD conference and I chatted to a couple of people and they said, look, You've got no contacts. You've got no way into the film industry. So forget that. Go and do something else. Um, Ridley Scott was a graphic designer. Um, Hitchcock apparently used to paint title cards at Paramount early on. And um, uh, Abbas Kiristami was a graphic designer. Uh, Mike Mills, a graphic designer. And they kept going through these people. And I was, and uh, I thought, well, here you go. His, if this is like a kind of back channel into filmmaking i'm gonna give that a go and um uh turns out i was pretty good at it and found my feet pretty quickly within the industry um uh working at a company called why not associates in london and that they taught me how to direct so uh i um it was a very it was a great way to get into the industry have it being a graphic design company that also directed so they kind of teach you the language, teach you the skill set, teach you how, uh, you know, what to do, what to say. Um, and more importantly, kind of gave you that confidence in knowing what you were doing was the right thing. And there's plenty of people who went through that same company, even though it's small. Uh, other filmmakers like uh, Mark Malloy, who's directing the new Beverly Hills Cop. Um, uh, Chris Riggett, who's a big commercial director. And um, uh, Kim Gehrig apparently was there for a while. I never overlapped with her, but she's another big commercial director. So even though there was only ever five or six people, we, were, we all kind of landed on our feet within the kind of commercial film world. So it was our, it was our kind of, you know, finishing school. It was a great place to, um, to kind of pick it up. But yeah, my background stems from graphic design. Um, and uh, yeah, it was my deliberate back channel into the film world. And how long were you doing like the graphic design before you were able to like get your first like project? Was it a commercial or a music video? What was the first project that you did? Yeah, so the first commercial um, for me, you know, there's several firsts. I mean, the first um, technical first was back in probably 2001 where I was uh, working as a graphic designer and we were building something where it was live action with um, uh, graphics so it was footballers kicking balls around with graphics moving in and around and it was at the time incredibly exciting you know working with some of your heroes and then um uh later on much later on like 2011 i got to um i got a script in which was for a video game called resistance 3 and they wanted a again a mix of live action and graphics where uh, the characters would be treated in a kind of 300 style, so heavy contrast, um, dimensional worlds, graphical blood splatters and all that stuff. And I said to them, well, actually, you know what, I think it's going to be more interesting if we go a live action route. So I cut a Ripomatic um, uh, from existing pieces, found a Johnny Cash track, made this kind of very chain gang style um it was almost like a fashion ad there was there was these kind of um high-end commercial 
aspirations in there which made it weird so you felt at the beginning that you're watching this kind of branded fashion ad and then it twisted and it got darker and weirder and more menacing and and i think that's what caught the imagination of a lot of people which led to it me getting much more work um uh and a feature film um and you know just a few years later i was directing you know some of my heroes in a um in a long form feature film um which yeah so it's 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 kind of testament to the to the kind of industry certainly in america where they're kind of excited for new new visions and new voices where those opportunities open up so yeah that was definitely a um an important first first real film so how did you get from england to america was it through your graphic design work yeah it, it was so it was well as yeah definitely graphic design but it was as my graphic design became more motion based so i started to do um bits and pieces there were some uh pieces for the bbc uh and they were quite graphic so there was stuff for the today program uh which got people's attention in america and then when i first moved over to america my first job was designing the graphics for the oscars which was a surreal job to do and um and then yeah every time i get a pitch i would try and send back a treatment with i want to do a live action i want to do this film you know so every time someone sent me a graphic pitch i'd go oh have you thought about all live action and you'd lose you know tons of them because they'd go no 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 we just want the animation you know just just that but the ones that would hit would kind of allow me to spread my wings a bit more and experiment and and tell a bit more story and build a bit more character and play with you know more more tools and 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 uh, more creative imagination and yeah i think that's that was my kind of slight nefarious approach but yeah it was it was it was the graphic design work that brought me from the UK to the US and it's a relatively unusual journey because usually commercially at least most commercial filmmakers like kind of make their name in the UK with with commercials and then move to America in their kind of dotage in their later years and uh, I was doing it the other way around I kind of made my name in America and then it was it was almost more difficult to kind of um go back to the UK and tell everyone no oh, actually I'm British I'm not you know coming from an American perspective uh so it's quite a uh, a strange way of working and quite a lot of uh uh English clients are surprised you know that I'm I'm uh, I'm English myself yeah because judging by your like website like just the clients that you work with it sounds like you're American like all the different things the Ford and then the mobile strike and Marines and Apple it's like oh you must be American and then your um your website says dot uk so it's like oh yeah well it took me the longest while to be able to get the dot com i think there was a there was a guy who's um who who kind of held on to it for forever um uh, somewhere in the arizona i think it was but um but yeah i uh a lot i've been very fortunate with a lot of american clients i mean things on the marines were fascinating i did i did ponder stepping on the set in a red coat and seeing a seeing what would happen kind of walking into the kind of in, into quantico so if you know the um the beginning of silence of the lambs that was where we were shooting we were shooting in the the same location where they'd shot uh their opening sequence as she's running up the hill in silence of the lambs which is the marine base at quantico where they also train the fbi um so that was one of those kind of holy shit moments i'm in the i'm in this kind of iconic space and i'm getting to work with these inspiring you know young um marines who are just kind of yeah yeah you see what they do and how they do it and and you're kind of you realize that what we do is um it's kind of the kind of fluffy side of it and what they're doing is the kind of hardcore inspiring science things yeah like uh, i remember seeing a square space commercial with john malkovich and somebody else has his john malkovich.com <laughs> He's like yelling at the screen. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Which I think is lovely. Um, I, it's a great spot that one, and I think the uh, the, the the whole world of how you kind of have your. It's weird to think, and it's very English for me to feel like 
awkward and strange about the whole branded thing but yeah it does become part of it when you kind of realize oh well, i should have you know how do people perceive it you know like you said if you see it as american but then you saw the domain name as british it, it's quite an interesting conundrum i remember seeing i think it was on your instagram the the first oscars somebody tweeted about it saying they didn't like it yeah yeah so that was that was i think a sort of huge source of pride um so 2015 um i was designing i was so i was the film was coming out and i was also designing the oscars that year and i was being quite bold and quite brave with what the approach was so it was to make 22 different looking graphic films uh to illustrate each of the 22 categories or 24 categories and the end result was no gold was used so gold was like i decided this is it no gold it's going to be this different color palette and the academy was all in with that and they came back and they said okay well it's we should play with this color palette and so the whole thing looked very different and it it illustrated really well i feel um what each category did so if it was production design it had all the items from that film laid out in this very kind of intriguing graphical style but then one person tweeted um and said you know this is the the graphic design is awful is the show is boring uh you know every the look of it's terrible and it specifically called out the graphic design and it was um the president in waiting donald trump and i took that as a mark of of yeah yeah i'm doing the right thing you know if, if that guy not known for his taste um is going to comment about uh about how bad how bad he feels it looks i know i've done the right thing because um yeah if he was saying it looked great i'd um i think i would have uh, fucked up so yeah very happy with that one and and um yeah if i wasn't trying to get um if i wasn't on an american visa at the time i would have made more of it but um now uh now i'm kind of safe in my living in america i don't have to worry about him tracking me down and deporting me i feel more confident with uh with uh joking about it yeah because doesn't he have like a, a entire gold room and gold toilet and stuff maybe he's like where's all the gold yeah <laughs> exactly he would have just been looking for it and you know in some regards there will be a, a a side of america who looks at the oscars as this kind of golden spectacle this 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 um this one this one kind of piece but i think there's more to it than that and certainly when you see the films there's more there's more to it than the award there's craft that goes into it and i get fascinated certainly as a filmmaker fascinated by all these craft categories and they're not just summed up by the same five clips uh from that year you know lord of the rings is not two quotes and a bit of a sound bite there should be more explanation to it and and what uh, what i was pushing to do was use um illustrative or photographic styling to kind of give the audience a little bit of a clue because you sit there and you don't you don't work in the film industry you don't know what art art direction is um i you know very few people i know do so it, it was my sense of oh well it's all the objects oh, okay well it's the sets and oh that makes sense and um so yeah there was deliberate a deliberate kind of um uh attempt to kind of give it a bit more uh of an understanding to each craft category but yeah so yeah so you mentioned um sometimes you'll get a brief and they would want a graphic design and you would try to push it into the live action world so how were you able to get those first couple of uh live action commercials and then like build up build off that those ones like you said you did the first one and then it was well received does it just keep compounding after that like you're able to show like have a show reel of type to show people examples of what you're trying to go for and then what's like the pitch process like when you go into a pitch like how do you convince them to to kind of choose you as the director well i think ironically it's kind of got harder like because the the, the kind of pitching process is now so detailed and you have to kind of indicate each facet of the film and try and illustrate it and i think at that point early on uh, when i was when i started out it was a lot more of kind of just finding your feet and just like all oh, right well does this work i'll make this 
rhythmatic of the film and this is what i think it should cut like and it should sound like and maybe there's... do you want to just explain what a rhythmatic is yeah so rhythmatic is a terrible word and apologies for there's uh, there's the rhythmatic there's crapomatic there's bordermatic and so uh, a rhythmatic is using clips from existing projects to try and illustrate the tone tonality and mood of the film and pacing of the film so I, I you know i was using variety of clips to kind of i was trying to find clips where there was a kind of strobe effect with gunfire um where there was kind of a uh, beautiful abstraction looking out of train windows um how people got getting uh, running running around trying to get onto this train and weird characters and all these different clips from hundreds of different sources and i cut them together with god's gonna cut you down by johnny cash and found that pacing and that rhythm and so that became you know that's a classic example of a ripomatic and then outside of that i've definitely used bordermatics which are when you sketch and storyboard and you cut those storyboards into the film which don't work as well but they also leave a bit more to the imagination because a bordermatic can maybe be you know perceived as a little bit too too deliberate and too on the nose um and and then a crapomatic is where you shoot the film yourself so you go out with your iphone or a gopro and you shoot it you get your mates and your colleagues to kind of uh, react and interact and um and that's becoming increasingly popular certainly as we're seeing more deliberate camera moves um as we kind of seeing that style of um a filmmaking where we're kind of pushing into objects which is really fun and kind of moving around and, and much more technically um aware filmmaking so yeah lots of different amatics yeah because yeah i think i i think i've seen um that Looper movie, the guy made a Rippermatic with like different movies and put it all together, and that was able. I think he made a short film first, but you know, putting together that at least the if you're going to ask for money or ask for somebody to to get yeah, you can show oh this is what I have in in mind, and you know sometimes storyboards they look cool like the sketches and everything, but do they really understand like what the camera is doing like with an arrow pointing and it's like. They're kind of like, oh, that's cool. Like he knows what he's doing, but they don't really get the whole feeling of it. So to have like music in there and sound effects and different, like the the cameras like moving in there, like get more of an idea of what you're trying to do, I guess. And the only restriction, and I think it's going to get more interesting, certainly as AI gets into it, because we're able to then bridge that gap between storyboards and uh, rhythmatics with AI, and you'll be able to write your description. Or describe it and, and and annotate it and then have those clips and those clips be fresh and not pre-existing you know it's it's all very well you know taking a clip from you know bullet or ronin for a car ripomatic but you know that the commercial is not going to be shot in the south of france or on the you know streets of san francisco so using those clips is a bit of a lie but if you can use AI to, to write out, you know, we're on a mountain road in Slovenia or Bulgaria, then, you know, it can produce and you've got a BMW on the street. You can start to produce exactly what you want it to be and it not be something that's uh, from a pre-existing film, which may set the wrong mood or, you know, or just be a bit too biased. It has its loaded connotations Like someone would go, oh, we don't want to. We don't want to click from Ronin because they, you know, shoot people in the face in that. And our brand is not about shooting people in the face. So, uh, so can we not have those, you know, so it's, uh, it's, you have to be careful with how it's done. And I think AI is going to provide a pretty interesting next stage for how we produce those kind of films. Yeah. And it's kind of like unreal engine and like virtual production where you can be like sunset and just dial it in and then boom. Okay. Nighttime, boom, dial it in not time straight away you don't have to wait for the weather you can just create it yourself so i think those kind of technologies allow like for the creativity to to be more instant but uh, like with ai it's also a, like a worry that anyone can do it but you still need to be able to tell a story so like we'll see how that goes
I think it's I think it's fascinating. I think the Unreal is a great great space to, to 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 simultaneously. You know, if you're building, however you're building it. I mean, Unreal. Uh, I was chatting just um, just two days ago to Greg Fraser, who's a big big Unreal Engine fan, and he's you know obviously he's the DP who shot Batman and Dune, um, and his next world is Unreal. Um, and the tests I've seen from him and in that space are are insane. And we're going to start to see that more and more often. And and I'm excited by what that potential means for how we can we can get stuff going. Similarly, it's also quite intimidating insofar as what you don't want is to limit yourself on a shoot day so that you're only getting what you sh showed in a ripomatic. You know, we only want to see those angles. We only want to see that perspective because we signed off on that. Because what's nice on a shoot is finding those little, you know, those moments where the dust kicks up in front of the lens, where the car sweeps around and maybe bumps against something or creates those little bits of dynamic energy that you weren't able to board because you didn't know it would happen and and you hadn't seen before. And I think that's that's the, uh, the, the, the biggest worry is there may be things that you kind of miss out on as we get more refined in our pre-production methodology yeah i did a um a documentary like as a director of photography on quincy jones and he mentioned like him and he did a film with spielberg steven spielberg and that they they work the same like the same in terms of he does music and um spielberg does film but they have a detailed plan of what they want to achieve but they leave room for like improvisation so you want to like uh, have everyone like have the a team there like everyone knows what they got to do but also don't be so like strict and defined about like this is all we're going to do like leave that room like quincy calls it like to let god walk in the room but like just let it leave it open so that you know that what you create on the day can come and, and i think that's the same thing with like creating films is like you don't want to be too strict and follow the storyboards it's good to have a plan but you want to leave that extra space for something new to happen on the day a, a good example of that is you know let's say on a car commercial uh, you know for instance the ford commercial i did when you're you're planning a route you're planning a road and you'll pra practice it with you know hot wheels cars and you'll go around and you'll go well actually you'll be really it will be really interesting and dynamic as you come around here and you've got the the Russian arm or the fixed rig coming around here. But often on the day, you suddenly notice maybe there's a reflection off a window um, that's kind of creating a little pool of light in the middle of the street that because you went on an extra half an hour uh, or you're a little early with when you got to that space that it's just hitting perfectly. So you, you shift those rules, you shift those, those plans and you get those little moments when, you know, a, a car passes through the light that you didn't expect to be there um uh, and it's it's that kind of thing that i think makes filmmaking exciting and and um lends itself to the the playfulness of of, of kind of discovering stuff in the edit as well yeah so talking about that uh, ford commercial the one with idris elba like what was the process like with that was there like a brief from an agency and they said that we want to do this certain like what was the story behind it like all these old vintage cars all driving to one area and then it was up to you to kind of interpret it and put your own like touch onto it exactly so yeah they came in with we want to tell this is a, a kind of the older mustangs this is a brand new Mustang. It's the first electric Mustang. And so there's obviously a lot of trepidation within Ford, within the brand about how it could be received. And once you saw the car, you saw that it was the the same family. And so when they called it the family of, of vehicles and they wanted to produce a film which celebrated the history, um, you could instantly feel this kind of reveal of, oh, there's one Mustang. And there's two, there's three, there's four, there's 10, there's 15. And then it's as, all the way through that, it's building with Idris, celebrate, who, who'd incidentally worked at Ford back in the day. Um, he would worked in, in the UK at the Ford plant. 
and so he uh he had this remarkable connection to it and that came across in just how he kind of delivered the uh delivered the dialogue but i found that beautiful like him feeling that personal connection with these cars being driven you know turning up on set early in the morning kind of four or five o'clock in the morning the lights the work lights coming on and you see 15 16 of the most beautiful examples of the mustang heritage from you know the the kind of early first generation to the kind of what were they the um uh the, the 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 one that i really didn't like the kind of boxy um boxy 80s versions that the crew loved because that was the that was the car that they you know got together with their first girlfriend in so they had these the crew were having these great moments of nostalgia with the um um the boxy look um uh, mustangs and then you got the kind of bullet era you got the eleanors from from um gone in 60 seconds and then as you start them all up all with their different sounds and you drive them all out of that of that parking lot everybody's hairs on the back of their neck are standing standing on end everybody knows this is going to be exciting and you've got fixed rigs on some of them we had the the kind of carbon fiber uh fixed mount on the back of um one of the early mustangs so you've got this great perspective down the back of the car but it involved a lot of painting out um, the fixed rigs on the front when we were out in uh, Lancaster, getting the three quarter as cars pull alongside, as other vehicle, uh, other Mustangs pull alongside. Yeah, those for me were the most exciting, where we were kind of revealing, um, you know, finding fun ways of revealing the new, the new cars as they went. In Fox Body was the name of the uh, the ones that I detested. I thought they looked really ugly. Those Fords, uh, those Mustangs. But they were the fan favourites within the crew camp, um, the Fox Body Mustangs. But yeah, and then yeah, the, each person on the, even some of the uh, the actors we had, one of the actors who sat in the car um, at a traffic light as the as the um, worked on the Mustang line in Detroit. So we found all these nice connections with people. Um, but yeah, that one was was a great script that wanted to tell the story of the brand and kind of show that the new Mustang was 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 you know in, has inherited that same philosophy so yeah it worked worked really well and did they choose uh, Idris to be the voice of it like was he already part of it uh, I think there were a couple of choices but Idris just jumped out I think because he has that great tonality and that he steps between you know he's you know as a very heterosexual man he's as sexy as one of the cars so i'm i'm kind of when you he steps on set and you're everyone's swooning so you know we're we're looking at the cars on one side and idris on the other he's the perfect storm to be kind of telling a car which has that kind of authenticity charm charisma gravitas so yeah i can't think of many actors that would that would kind of straddle that line quite as well as him so he was a it was a great choice there were others i can't remember who they were but he definitely leapt out to the um to the top of the tree yeah and like it's hard to kind of articulate but like how did you make it so like epic like you know with all the cars rushing to and the people like a lot of the reaction shots like that was part of like building in where are the like you know there's all these pieces of the puzzle you got to put together and like the the pacing and the timing and like when to put shots where like was that just learnt from years of experience or trying to like how do you build up that style i've got an amazing team of people around me so when you're finding really interesting locations so the locations team are bringing these amazing places forward I've got a great editorial team who I work with. Um, I, I, a cinematographer, Joost van Gelder, who always tries to shake stuff up and add something interesting to the equation. Um, and, you know, fast moving ADs, great stunt team. You know, all of that lends itself to being able to produce something where I'm able to go, okay, let's push it a bit further. 
let's go a bit further out here and we'll travel really quickly you know we'll shoot that very quickly we'll fix rig there and i'm quite i'm quite detail oriented when it comes to production in a uh, you know in terms of being you know let's only shoot this let's get this and let's move on to the next piece so we can get more and give ourselves more opportunity um to tell an expansive story so you know the drone team was simultaneously up in the air while we were shooting with the camera car on the streets through downtown la so that's why in that drone shot we had to paint out the camera car and then replace it with um uh, a, a, you know an extra vintage mustang just so it you know the the geography of the scene the geometry of the scene felt complete but yeah uh, it, the epicness i think comes i always find the best way to produce an epic film is to make it relatable and then once you relate to it so that's where the humanity and the reactions come in from we can all remember as a kid looking out of a window and seeing an amazing car pass by we can all kind of instinctively remember hearing that sound when you're not you know and then turning to, to kind of notice something so if if you can see yourself or a friend or a relative or a loved one in, in those people that you see in the film or it reminds you of a, of a film or a, or something which which produces that that sense of recognition then once you've got that then you can make it bigger and then you can go like holy shit and now there's 15 of them then the audience is taken on a bit more of a ride the minute they relate then you can go crazy and break the rules so that's where i find the best the best way to do epic is is make it relatable and then push it that bit further uh, make it bigger bigger scale more unrelatable um uh which is ironic you know if you make it relatable then the audience is hooked i'm hooked then you can make it unrelatable because then by that point you can imagine what fantasy what fantastical space and that could possibly be like so i think it's that it's that combo which really makes it um makes it exciting makes it big makes it feel like you can leave a, a kind of dream world that you could imagine cool and then in terms of like winning the job like uh, were you competing uh, against a lot of different people i'm sure they they give you a brief and then it's up to you to kind of say this is what i'm gonna do like do you create like a treatment and like were you still doing the the ripper matix or storyboards like that kind of stuff to try and um, convince them or do you do like a pitch in a in an office room with like a bunch of people and you got to explain what you want to do like how is that process of winning the job what what does it entail that was slightly a weird one but a traditional route is you you do the call they tell you a bit about the script and then you look for those you try and ask the questions we're like okay well where are the the bits that you haven't thought about or where are the areas that you want me to push where are the areas that you don't want me to push and then once you get that briefing then you go away right work out try and work out what excites you what brings that kind of fresh look fresh feel to it that point you then send them your treatment design it and then luckily from my graphic design background i'm able to kind of come at it with a little bit of a, a, a unique perspective you send off a treatment and hope they get as excited by it as you are because at that point i'm usually that's it i'm once I'm treating on it, I get really involved and excited by what it could be. Um, and it's at that point that I um, um, that, that you then hear back their notes. If they've got more, you make a few changes. And if they're excited, you go on to be, you know, their recommend. Um, and if you're their recommend, then it's a case of them selling it to the client. And if the client trusts the agency, it's usually a no-brainer. But if the client you know has something else in mind or their relationship's a bit weird with the agency it can often go in different directions so it's at that point that you find out whether you want it and then you're kind of gearing up to go on that particular project it did involve a trip to new york um to sit in a meeting room and chat with the team about it get quite kind of hands-on really um and really go through the details because more often than not with brand with agencies they spend six months working on a project and you're coming in after a you know an hour-long phone call and throwing spanners in every different but you know what about this what about that 
and you don't want to break what they've done and you don't want to break the kind of the, the film that they've sold so you're trying to find that relationship with your excitement and passion for it and your ideas with things that they may have tried before and not liked or things that they're really excited by um but need a director's voice to be able to sell it through so it's a it's a it's a really good opportunity to collaborate the more time you can spend with an agency at that point the more you can get inside their brain um and try and um you know push it and pull it into the shape that you think is going to make it you know that much more or um you know that much more interesting or exciting yeah so what is it like when there is like a disagreement or you're trying to push for a certain angle or you want to like change the script or like how do you make sure that like you said you're not upsetting them because that's their like they've been working on this for six months but how do you push enough to make sure that it's not a bad idea and that it's something that's going to make sense for you and that you want to do so this is a, just a matter of kind of like reading people and figuring out like how they work and i'm just interested in that whole like psychology of like how to push and where to push it's very intuitive i think when you get down to it when you're in the room um increasingly agencies are, are super you know the teams on agencies are super smart and 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 share the same vision and i think one of the nice things about there being so many different voices in the directing world is they when they pick you know the three or four people they want to pitch on it usually it's because they share the same aspirations so they're already we're already somewhat speaking the same language and so when you get into the room with them um it's just it's, it then becomes more about nuance um and so you're just trying to find you know making sure that something's not too dark or 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 not too you know gritty or dirty or there will be constraints that they may have that will be above the agency that will be the client where maybe they've done a job before where someone was too dark or too or too uh, moody and they want to make sure that it doesn't go in that realm and so my, my job is to is to keep the the cinematic excitement there uh, whilst not limiting what the dp can do um and so yeah you judge the room you judge you know try and get in and you know whether it's a case of using references or you as you're shooting um as you're going around locations trying to kind of get lighting tests and stuff like that try and get that in front of their their eyes to to to, to feel what will and cannot work um so yeah that's it's definitely a uh, a delicate balance and it's a it's it's a bit of psychology but i think increasingly the teams are already kind of share the same spirit and i'm not someone who sits there and obstructs a vision if an agency has fought for an idea um, my job is to is to is to make it as good as it can be from that idea rather than you know throwing an idea out um because i want to you know do something completely different because that's that's not my job i guess it helps to work with people that know what they're doing and have done it before so you kind of know the steps along the way of um when to ask when not to ask like in terms of where to push maybe like all in the pre-production phases where you can kind of ask these questions and try and change things but like you said if you start doing it too late it's a bit late you know so um when you get onto set and there's like a monitor there and the client's looking at it and everybody's like making their like comments how do you kind of make sure that what you're capturing is in line with everybody so that when you get into post-production it's not too late like you've already captured it by that time it's like yeah well increasingly you know people will tell you if you're if you're if you're in the wrong realm people will tell you so the way i try and avoid that is as much communication ahead of time so before you start shooting if you're going going into the video village and saying okay guys the next shot we're doing we're going to be here we're going to be getting this the camera's going to be moving from here to here it's only a short shot it's going to be messy there's going to be you know stuff going all over the place so i may not come in to kind of check on things but i'll be on the radio if there's any if there's any thoughts so that when people see what's 
happening on the camera they're not like well we thought it would be you know there'd be you know 17 dogs running along and a um and uh you know chasing after a balloon and we've got suddenly a robot running through firing guns everywhere you know there's no, not going to be that disconnect so I'm, I'm i'm making sure that people know before we're shooting what's what they're going to see so that um, that shoot period is as, as smooth and, and quick as possible because the ideal is that we can then move on, go to the next place, get the next piece. And I like to move quite quickly and be quite detail oriented so that we can keep the flow going and, and ultimately end up um, with more opportunity and choices in the edit, if, um, um, which always goes down well. Do you make sure that everybody who's got to make a decision is in the pre-production? Because there's nothing worse than having a boss higher up that's later on saying something different than what you already like decided on. So like, I guess just making sure like, to keep communication open and all the way along, like you said, even down to the shot, like, is this what you guys are thinking? Like, and then when you get into post-production, it's not a big surprise unless there's somebody else coming from, like, who's that guy talking now? Like, does that ever happen? Rarely, rarely. I think it's quite a refined ship now, the, the, the kind of the way it works. And I think maybe in the edit, there'll be some extra voice that will come in. And so increasingly working with brands, you'll find that brands work with other brands. So a lot of work that I do, there'll be, a brand that also let's for example playstation will also be working with marvel or or you know another brand and so there will be times when there'll be multiple different clients in different directions and they'll all have different things but the key with that is just be transparent just be upfront to show everybody and try and get through to every voice um the intention and then you know as long as there's no surprises you just don't want people turning up and going wait what is this you know what am i looking at um and i think that is um yeah there is occasions when there's someone brand new that may have a different opinion but uh i think increasingly there's a it's a, it's a very dialed in buttoned up world so that that doesn't happen thankfully that much yeah. and then in terms of like camera equipment and technology throughout the years like do you get like super in depth into like lenses and camera choices and stuff or do you leave that more up to the dp i love new technology and we i just finished a job where we uh were using a brand new rig which never been used before for a pov um where the um instead usually with pov you've got these they look very cool but the mount is on the front of the face and you've got this six inch camera then a four inch lens and so you only ever see like a tiny bit of someone's hands in front of the camera or you get a very wide lens and everything's incredibly barreled um and even then you know it's distorted or whatever so um an old uh, college friend of mine actually um who'd actually worked in the graphic design world as well has developed this this new camera called the um cyclops rig and it allowed the perspective to be on your eye line so you would see exactly what a normal human sees when they look around they look down at their arms and it changed the game for me in terms of this way in which we could film but that came through a personal relationship so the dp hadn't seen it and the dp mauro had worked on a lot of amazing camera technique commercials um and so sometimes that happens. That's more rare than I'm introducing something to the equation. Definitely much more rare. But more often, you know, the DP will, will be, I, I trust the DP's ability once they've got that, um, the brief in mind, once they've sent them tonality references and spoken to them about the project, when they're choosing, okay, well, I think we should be anamorphic and we should try for the kind of T series or whatever series of Panavision then you're starting to get into exciting places where they're throwing um uh you know in the same way that i'm putting my vision into the script the dps put in their vision into my film as well and we can kind of find that really interesting avenue to play with where maybe there's some interesting lens or or technique for various pieces an interesting mount um uh an interesting kind of smaller form camera um it was a few years ago i remember 
uh, shooting and um, you know being told about the FX3, which is now being used for a whole feature film and the creator. Um, and the FX3, we were shooting POV stuff for an Olympic spot because the depth of the of the camera uh, was was astonishing and the portability was amazing. So it 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 freed us up from having to use the full Sony Venice, which we use only for a couple of shots. Um, which again, I love the Sony Venice because of the Rialto, where you could separate the head from the body, and having these huge cables and and I, so I think you know it's finding those interesting tools, interesting techniques, and and I think DPs. And I'm I'm fortunate enough to have worked with almost everyone I've ever wanted to work with in that realm, um, and you know had their their input in in the films that I've done. Um, and so yeah, I feel very spoiled on that front. I remember seeing another one by Ian Pons Jewel. He did like an Oculus commercial. I know you've seen that, and he used two twins. So the two twins like. Two arms. I was like, oh, that's a good idea. But and then, yeah. so I was working with the same DP, Mauro uh, Chirello, and he, um, it was, yeah. So I was like, well, we can't, there was technically we couldn't do two people. What I loved about the Ian's Oculus job is it's wider, like it feels very dynamically wide. So it was finding, and I've also done jobs where we power it mount, where we mount it on the side of the, uh, on the shoulder, which gives you a decent perspective, and it's certainly for, further back. But the Cyclops gave us a little bit more flexibility and it hadn't been used with the Venice before. Previously, it was just FX3. So, yeah, it, we were testing and producing new stuff with it the whole way through, which was exciting. What about like in terms of communicating like on set with your team? Like you got to talk to the DP and then like how do you orchestrate like a big action scene with cars and everything? Like how does that whole thing work? So I think I think we we chatted briefly about it earlier, but um, the idea of the the kind of little Hot Wheels cars comes into play, crappy drawn maps on tables and um, come into play. Even uh, you know shooting with iPhones and and uh, and uh, Hot Wheels cars, you know, pops up every now and then. But at a certain point as you're stepping up into the real gear and the real world, the communication gets trickier. You know, you may all be on walkies on slightly different channels. I'm sat in a camera car, you know, squeezed into a footwell. So I'm not seeing if the other camera kind of passes by and I've got a kind of handheld monitor and maybe a headset on so I can chat to the DP who's in another car or, you know, and then a radio to chat to the drone team. So it's, it's kind of juggling um uh you know multi-sensory juggling um and, and intense adrenaline rushes uh and uh, yeah it's it's the communication is the key try and set it out uh, set your stall out as, as 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 um cleanly as possible before you shoot but know that once you're in the midst of it you'll see something change something you want to go at a different speed you want to overtake it at a different point you want to pull the brakes back let another car go ahead um and that's that will all happen in the moment and that all comes through like in the moment communication whether it's through headsets radios and i've definitely had kind of multiple monitors on handsets headsets for one uh one camera radio for another and even third radios for you know to chat to your producer royal team um and it can it can get crazy and all of that while you're Kind of, and I'm a I'm a short guy, so I'm I'm fortunate enough to squeeze into most cars, weird nooks and crannies, and and certainly that's that's a useful useful trick. If I was six foot six, I would um, I would find that a lot tougher. And then, what's the relationship like with like a first AD? Because they're the guy that's coming to you saying like you got like five minutes left for this shot, or you got to move on, like let's go to the next place like how does that kind of work between you and and the person who's the first ad i mean i love and some of the first ad's i work with i love and repeatedly work with because there's a a kind of calm collaborative energy and i like to do a lot of planning ahead of time so i'll i'll write down here's my plans for what time of days are important for this shot i think we should be at magic hour for this shot i think we should be 
you know, later in the evening. And then there's flexibility here. And then the AD looks at that and goes, well, you haven't put any lunches in. You haven't got like you have you've missed out all of this and they'll redo it, but they'll have that basic framework in mind for what I'm trying to do. And then from there, you know, and increasingly I'm kind of I'm you know factoring in those things. But on a broad scale, the the AD is certainly kind of reshaping what I'm thinking because increasingly ADs are coming on a bit too late onto a project. So I want to give them more time. And if I can give them a head start by planning out what my ideal schedule would be, then it's only going to help when it comes into the, um, the job itself. So anyone cool, calm um, is welcome on my set as an AD. Um, if you're able to take all kinds of craziness happening and still kind of keep measured, if you're a problem solver, you know, the best thing to be is when something's, uh, and it's, it's rare, if something's going wrong, if they're able to kind of calmly work out how to, fix it rather than flapping and panicking that person's you know golden you know that's that's the the dream for for for, for any ad that i work with and then in terms of like time frames i'm sure every project's different but what is the kind of like general amount of time that you get to like work on a project like you you obviously get the call and then how long to create a treatment and then how long for the shoot and post-production like you could, it varies, but what is like a, a general amount of time? General average is about probably a week for the treatment, which is a little long, I feel. I think certainly I find that you can suddenly, you can sit on something a bit too long if you've given that week, because you'll you'll start second guessing your own thoughts and stuff like that. But then after that week, you probably, it's probably about two and a half weeks, um, maybe luxuriously three weeks for before you go into production. And really at that point you're looking for locations so the first thing you do is travel out and direct a scout and that will be to approve locations often with roads you need to get three weeks of permitting time so you need to get choose those roads very early on with a car job because they'll involve shutting things down they'll involve stopping highways and local councils are really keen and understandably so we're getting that knowledge as early as possible. Then, you know, before the pandemic, you'd stay out there and you'd do the um, casting locally. So you'd still be there for casting. Art department would be kicking in. Um, and then gradually, as you're ticking off all these boxes of production, you find yourself, you know, a few days away from go. And that's when your pre-production meetings, your tech recce's come in. Um, and then maybe there's a, a little bit of a lighter day, the day before you shoot, as you've solved, ticked every box. And then you, uh, so it's, yeah, a week of, a week of treating, two and a half, three weeks of, of, of prep. Uh, although that's somewhat luxurious now. And then, um, then straight into the shoot for, you know, three, four days, um, usually, uh, and then post. Post can be anything. On your website, there's a commercial Audi Night Watchman. Do you want to just talk a little bit about that project and anything that kind of stands out? Night Watchman was a fun one. So we were out, we were in Mexico City. Um, and so you, because what's great about, uh, what was important with that is we had to be able to get the car there. So shooting in North America, um, or at least kind of around LA is really expensive. And so it limits the potential of how much you can do, how much you can get. And I had this kind of vision for all these different worlds, these factories, these spaces, these big art builds um, and kind of installation pieces and making the brand, like emphasizing that the brand is as um, high end and conceptually driven as possible. So there was these kind of great visual set pieces, these really intriguing behind the scenes feeling elements um and so that was a um a, you know shot in mexico we had three days i think it was a lot of a lot of variety um we were shooting during the world cup i remember stopping between scouts as we parked up in in the middle of this mountain village somewhere and the whole t the whole village was crowded around a tv watching mexico beat germany which was one of those kind of iconic moments in mexico watching 
kind of, I think they were still world champions at the time, the Germans um, in the World Cup. And then, yeah, for that project, it was about telling the story of this character who was similarly bemused and inspired by the car company he guarded. He looked over at night. So he had that kind of curiosity of someone who goes, I wonder what happens behind that door. Or those guys are crazy. They're still working. It's two in the morning. Or I don't even know what goes on in that room. Let's not go there. So there was this kind of weird visual journey and an exaggeration of some of the techniques, you know, some fun stuff with lasers in the middle of a forest, um, you know, hanging up against the car. We had the chassis that we stripped away, um, sorry, the body that we stripped the chassis off and we dipped into a, a, a big vat of paint and kind of pulled it out in this kind of graphic expression lit by these kind of changeable LED mood boards, uh, light boards. Um, and then there was the the engine that we got from another car. So the art department did this amazing job of sourcing these parts which were correct to the different the different models of cars, you know, robots. Um, so we used um, motion control robots to act as kind of sewing robots. Um, yeah, so it was a combo of weird and wonderful to make a, um, a spot that kind of dips its toe into what the audience would like to believe happens behind the scene at a car factory. And I'm sure it's more impressive in other areas and more mundane in, 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 in on the other side. So I think it's, uh, you know, it's an expression of kind of curious excitement and intrigue in that, which I felt we kind of, we, um, you know, managed really well. Cool. And then there's another one called Audi Butcher, and I see there's the cinematographer's Chase Irvin. Like, how do you go about like finding a director of photography, or like choosing one, or like, is it dependent on who's available, or is it up to the agency, or is it your decision on like who you want to work with? So it starts off with my decision. Off, more often than not you know, you're challenging. If you're coming into a project late or a project's got a short turnaround time, the DPs you've, you're you excited about are missing or on another project already. But that one was lucky enough to be working. It was beginning of the year. Uh, Chase was available. It's in his home city. So that's always a, it's always a boon when you're able to go, oh, you can, you know, go back, see your family. Um, it's a bit tempting, you know, because it's a small project. It's only a two day shoot. Um, and so that, you know, fortunate to get him and he's, he's such a craftsman and we were able to elevate, um, a relatively small story into something that felt bigger and bigger and bigger. And the weird level of intrigue of a, a woman walking into the butcher and asking for a cut and then being shown, you know, you want something more than that. And it's, you know, stripping away that it's you know, it's not mundane. The car is something more than the mundane. And, you know, the metaphor being that you can go down and get a Toyota or a, or a, um, uh, a Hyundai, but the Audi, this kind of more intriguing brand uh, is, I think, pretty plain to see. But, uh, and I think it does it in a, in an odd and uh, funny, in a bizarre way. Um, and I think ultimately when you look at the sh kind of the key shots of the car at the end, car feels super sexy. We have this great garage space, which enabled the lighting to feel, you know, to ping off. I think cars often feel sexiest in that darker space, but the balance is that, you know, clients and the audience don't want to see the car perpetually in those dark spaces. They want to feel them in the space that they feel. They see their cars more often, which is daylight out in the out in the open on those mount, on those on the roads where where the um, the car may more naturally be uh, be found. So that's a, an interesting balance. It's trying to trying to find those spaces where the car feels as sexy as possible, um, and uh, you know visually, you know some of the curves and bits of the the metalwork really sell itself if you can control the lighting as much as possible. So that's the um, the, you know, the, I think the trickiest part is, is balancing that. So you started off doing like graphic design and the f commercials, and then you went early on into a feature film. Like what's the future like? Do you want to do more 
uh, feature films or do you want to do more commercials? Like what is, what is in your idea of like what you want to achieve for the future? Um, I think, you know, with slightly ADHD, I love the commercial world insofar as you're getting the, and the short film world is you're getting a short period of time, dipping into this amazing project, an amazing world. And I'm really fortunate. I pretty much get, I get to work on projects where the brief is expansive, cinematic, exciting, visually stylish and interesting. Um, and you're telling that in, you know, over the course of a month. And so if you're going from project to project and you've got a month telling this wild story in the middle of a desert somewhere, and then the next month you're in on the top of a mountain in the snow telling a diff completely different story. And there's nothing more exciting than that. And I loved the filmmaking process and uh, Maggie was a phenomenal kind of learning process, but it was, it was a, maniacally crazy shoot and there's a whole coterie of interesting stories from that with regards to you know the budget on that was less than most of you know most of the commercials i do i think we worked out the below the line budget was 790 grand on maggie um and uh it was super low budget and the art department had eight thousand dollars which eventually doubled to sixteen thousand after a bit of a a bit of a um, tug, tug of war with the uh, with with um, financiers, but I mean that's that's a you know a tenth, if not a twentieth, of what the art department budget should have been for a film like that. So it was a lot, you know, making a lot with that. So it didn't leave me with wanting to jump back into film immediately, and I think I'm I'm kind of keen to kind of get back into it now, but only in the last couple of years have I with the passion for making something longer form really come back in and there were a few projects swirling at the moment but um uh i'm just you know excited to be dipping in it may sound crazy but you know the the projects that inspired me when i started out were commercials and music videos and the, sh the short form was was what excited me about the industry these these funny visually interesting powerful mini stories told over 30 seconds or a minute is um is is uh, it's hugely satisfying for me so i'm um you know very fortunate and happy to be to be digging into that world yeah because having like a giant movie star like arnold schwarzenegger on the film i'm sure you would have expected a bigger budget but was how did how were you able to get him was it through working with him on like a uh, commercial like the no, I mean that was before the commercial film, before the before the commercial. So the film was, the script was phenomenal. It was a kind of blacklist uh, award-winning script. It was super contained. Uh, it was a fresh take on the zombie genre, um, and I think. Uh, I was working on the Walking Dead title sequence. Um, at the time when I first read the Maggie script and and I thought wait are we you know Walking Dead has there's some similar areas in 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 this you know is it going to tread on the toes and I think it did I think there was moments where we were casting for people and there were um you know there were uh, quite a few people saying it's you know there's some similarities to the Walking Dead it, it mirrors this tonality and, and themes but Arnold came up relatively early and at first I was kind of unsure and then the more i thought about it the more i kind of and then meeting him he kind of goes into this you can immediately see how exciting the potential of having someone who's whose whole work and the language of what you understand him as is about strength and if you see a character who's perceived as strong like he's the world's strongest man not the world's strongest man, but the bodybuild, you know, one Mr. Olympia. He was the governor. He's hugely powerful in almost everything he did, action star. And to see him break down and cry, I suddenly got this kind of excitement in me uh, with regards to the potential for what he could do and what he could bring. And, you know, he was exactly that. I mean, there was a moment, there was, there's two scenes when he breaks down and cries in the film. 
and they were stunning you know the, the the whole crew were kind of silent afterwards you see this man who's that powerful breaking down and what that brought to the film is it said to the audience if someone this powerful can break you've got no chance so there was a shorthand we didn't have the money to tell these bigger story you know to try and tell that in other ways to try and tell you know different family uh, uh, you know uh, moments but to be able to tell it with one character and bring him to life and tell the story of how a man um was fracturing as his daughter was dying um and that man not just be your average man but be the guy you go to in town when you need a problem sorted out and he's breaking down you, you, you're fucked. so um that that was hugely exciting and that kind of i looked at and we me and him would watch kind of clint eastwood films and we talk about clint eastwood you know his journey from action to comedy to drama and arnold had done action and comedy and he hadn't yet done drama i mean what an exciting prospect and he's very he's been very kind to me since making the film in terms of talking about it as he's very proud of the film and and how it i was a director who woke him up to kind of the dramatic performance and and kind of brought that out and and you know what a great testament you know he put me he put me along uh, alongside the names of kind of james cameron who made him act, you know brought him into action the action world ivan reitman into the comedy world and he said you know, and I introduce him to the dramatic world. So, I mean, that's a highly esteemed place to be and very fortunate. And I think his his relationship and patronage on the film um, cemented it as, as this kind of weird, weird outsider kind of um, piece. I, um, yeah, I think it's, uh, but then my one story I will say, I will say on it, it was shot with one lens. So we shot it with, a 65 mil macro lens for the whole film um and it started off by uh, uh by choice and then um with the budget i initially i was told that the rental company had repossessed them but actually the producers had just set, sent them back because they saw we were only using one lens for the first two or three days so they decided that well eh, it's fine they don't need any others but yeah all shot with a 65 mil macro lens wow that's uh achievement in itself but going into uh like the mobile strike commercial i'm sure that was probably bigger budget than the whole film yeah mobile strike was 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 the kind of reward i suppose we both went into it this really fun brand um wanting to to kind of just have fun with it introduce their brand and their and their game um in as kind of playful a way as possible and arnold kind of I think we were in Prague and he was in, you know, great space, great mood and having fun. You know, it was a nice, it was a great project for him to be involved with. Uh, so we'd go out for dinner and, and chat about, you know, that project, other films, other projects. Um, and um, yeah, it was, a, it was a, um, yeah, definitely a, a bigger budget. What was it like um, working with Arnold and, and trying to get him to do these emotional like crying scenes like how did you what did you talk about like how did you like approach that kind of scene with somebody like like Arnold well I have to say I did not expect him to bring real tears to the to the table and that was maybe my preconception my my kind of you know even though I chatted to him even though I mean he says it himself he goes into everything like highly prepared he knew the script inside out and gone through in great detail. But I, I talked about the, the emotions of the scene and I built these, I found it really useful, built these emotional arc for, um, for each character and literally printed them out, big kind of charts and the emotional arc for each scene, where they're going to be on a scale of one to 10, you know, no one ever hitting the 10 and, you know, various actors um, whose emotionality could come out quite quickly and quite easily, I'd kind of taper it down and have this graph so it kind of sat at a lower, a lower, a lower level. And then with Arnold, 
it was a slow burn so we set those scenes up to be shot later in the in the production so he could get to grips with the emotionality of the character but he was already there i mean he he has it all in him and i think he just he enjoys so much the kind of the humor the light-hearted the things that we know him for those kind of action punches and one-liners that it's often mistaken for that is his real personality whereas in actual fact he can bring out the highly dramatic really quite quite beautifully um and i think it's just you know maggie gave him that opportunity and and we set it up we gave set the production in a way that would facilitate it we talked about the right things we judge you know we riff off different projects um and um you know i did what i thought would be best to kind of enable those things and but i think really i can't take anything away from his ability to be able to kind of bring it out on the day and 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 break and feel that all those different parts of the personality i mean he's a father himself so i'm sure a lot of that and we talked about him as a father and him bringing you know having to have those conversations as a father and perhaps they played a part but who knows we've I've ne i haven't talked to him about what makes him cry um but uh but yeah suppose one day i shall do you have any um advice for filmmakers who want to get into like directing commercials or um feature films or any any kind of like little thoughts of advice that you can kind of give to them to riff off the kind of car theme what i would say is if you want to get into cars have something that showcases that you can make cars look sexy in as many different lights as possible daylight magic hour magic hour always looks sexy um and then nighttime nighttime showcases your lighting ability Magic Hour will showcase your dynamic movement ability. Daytime showcases you can make anything work. Um, if you can do those three things, that's great. But only show have one car thing in your reel. The rest of your reel should showcase how creative, how imaginative, um, how visually interesting, how your storytelling, how you know the different aspects of your filmmaking are. Because very rarely does a car company or a come to you because they want you to just shoot their car more often than not they want you to tell a story and have a bit of car in it um so car people it took me a long time to be able to work get a car job it's quite a con contained uh, part of the industry but once you get there and they're excited by you 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 know you open the doors yourself um but i would say anything but cars should be on your reel have one thing which showcases three different looks but outside of that, anything but cars.